Hi, thanks for the talk, uh, inspirational as always. Um, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts or comments on, on the Edward Snowden interview. I'm, I'm sure you saw it or at least part of it. When was this one? Um, this was one at Bloxville, I'm not sure which one, but his comment specifically related to the public ledger being the biggest security flaw in Bitcoin at scale. Yes, so um, transactions on open public blockchains are open. However, they are not associated with uh, identities directly. So The identifiers are not IP addresses, or email addresses, or human identifiers. Bitcoin addresses cannot easily be correlated. However, um, we have a lot of work to do to improve the privacy of the system. And there's a lot of research being done already to add layers of encryption um, and fungibility, as it's called, to the coin, so that you can't easily trace transactions from one to another. There's a few um, cryptocurrencies that are specializing in privacy and doing advanced research, uh, and there are also some research projects to improve the privacy of Bitcoin. Um, and Snowden is right in terms of we cannot go to very broad use under adversarial conditions with the blockchain as it is today. Uh, that would be a bit of a privacy nightmare. Just like going to a mainstream broad internet um, without encryption on the IP layer was a mistake that has been exploited very effectively by intelligence agencies. Um, but I think we will. Um, add those encryption features and make the system more private. Keep in mind, you've also got to consider what you're comparing it with, um, because a great deal of the world is now going plastic, and cash is being abolished in many countries around the world. Um, some European countries are all cash, Germany. Uh, some European countries are now all digital. In Sweden, I think 95 plus percent of all transactions are using a plastic card. Every single one of those transactions is under full surveillance and not just by one intelligence agency you can assume by all of them simultaneously overlapping and surreptitiously so we already have a digital money future which is a totalitarian surveillance nightmare which gives enormous power to a few people and we have the alternative and the public blockchain isn't in a good state today but we can make it much more private i tie my horse to that one Re-anonymizing UTXOs. KJ asks, Hey Andreas, my UTXO set has been tied to my personal identity since I've been buying from Coinbase after MT Docs blew up. Specifically, more than 80% of my cryptocurrency holdings are wrapped up in a single UTXO. What would be your recommended process for splitting and obfuscating that UTXO in order to separate it from my identity? Thanks. So first of all, Quick question: What is a UTXO? A UTXO stands for Unspent Transaction Output, and that may sound like gibberish to you, but basically, um, UTXO is the result of a Bitcoin transaction. The result of a Bitcoin transaction puts an amount that is available to spend and hasn't been spent yet as a, an output of a transaction. It puts it into an address, so it's spendable. Um, so a UTXO is a spendable amount that an address controls. Um, every transaction creates UTXO. It creates spendable amounts. And what, basically, what KJ is saying is that he has all of his cryptocurrency in a single address, uh, or most of it, in a single chunk, um, a single UTXO. And because that came from Coinbase, or uh, yes, Coinbase, then it's basically tied to his identity. So, Because Coinbase knows who he is and has information about his identity, and they um, presumably provide information to various analytics companies, and other analytics companies can follow these identities, they can track and see that this address actually belongs to KJ, and they know that all of this Bitcoin belongs to KJ. And what KJ is asking is, how do you make it so that it's not so obvious to all of these tracking companies um, that this is my cryptocurrency? Okay, first of all, uh, an, an important disclaimer: in some countries, trying to obfuscate your identity, 
in that way is illegal. So you need to understand the regulations in the country where you're where you are. I don't know where KJ is. And in other countries it's a gray area. It's not clear, for example, in the US as to whether using anonymization services um, to uh, obfuscate the source or destination of funds uh, is allowed for private individuals. It's certainly not allowed for regulated institutions. They have to subscribe to regulations like uh, AML, CTR, KYC, etc. Um, but if this is legal in your jurisdiction, and if you're interested in the technology behind it, this is a key issue of privacy because the fact that blockchains are transparent and publicly available and auditable by anyone means that unless you take some basic precautions, you could be um, essentially creating problems for your own privacy. Uh, and so, what if you wanted to have the same privacy as you have with cash? Uh, and to have that modicum of privacy that human beings have had for thousands of years uh, when transacting in the first peer-to-peer -peer currency, cash. Um, so there are a number of tools to do that, and um, they, they, they basically what they, these tools do is they do various forms of mixing, whereby you do a transaction collaboratively with other users where you take uh, all of your um, inputs and make a single transaction which has multiple inputs and multiple outputs in such a way that it's not obvious who's making which inputs and which outputs. So even though you can trace all the transactions going in, you don't know where they're going out to, and that makes it difficult for analytics companies to track you. Um, this type of transaction, a transaction that has multiple participants, is called a coin join. Coin join. Uh, and it was invented uh, back in 2012 or 2011, I think, by uh, Greg Maxwell, among others. And it's since developed quite a bit. There's a number of uh, software packages that allow you to participate in a coin join. Uh, probably the most uh, current one is Join Market. There's also um, um, other ways to obfuscate your ownership. But the bottom line is that if you buy from a regulated institution that has uh, KYC regulations, know your customer regulations, that has your identity, then you are revealing the ownership of uh, your currency. If you wanted to buy cryptocurrency anonymously, you should probably have bought it with cash. Uh, it's very difficult after a multi-year um, entanglement of your identity with your cryptocurrency to now try to pull back that breach of privacy. Um, the fact is that it is now known that you have that cryptocurrency. So even if you obfuscate, people will assume you still have it. Uh, they just won't know in which address it is, perhaps. So it's not ideal. Um, so there you go. Uh, if it's legal in your jurisdiction, you can look into some of these uh, technologies, uh, but be careful that you understand what you're doing, because uh, this may uh, put you in some very deep uh, hot water. Mark asks about Schnorr signatures and UTXO consolidation. Mark says, I am excited about how Schnorr signatures can improve privacy for multi-signature transactions by summing up the keys so that it looks like an ordinary single-payer transaction. But how does this look like with UTXO consolidation? Does Schnorr also provide increased privacy for the individual? What would a UTXO consolidation with Schnorr signatures look like in a blockchain explorer? Um, so, Mark, um, no, you can't use signature aggregation, um, as far as I understand, in order to do UTXO consolidation. The problem with UTXO consolidation isn't the signatures, although we could apply a single signature across lots of um, UTXO. The problem in that case is that you're bringing all of the UTXO, all of the inputs together, um, as inputs in one transaction, which therefore associates them. Now, if you could construct that transaction to look, or if it is a coin join, um, so that there are multiple participants sending outputs in multiple directions, and you could also encrypt the values, that would be a useful privacy layer for UTXO consolidation. 
But um, on its own, with Schnorr signatures, I don't see how that would provide increased privacy for the individual. I run a company called ZPX out of Singapore and India. Um, I first learned from your book about how Bitcoin is actually not anonymous, but pseudonymous. So it's going to be a permanent record of every transaction. Um, you have these secrecy coins like Zcash and Monero and Grin and Beam and all these new coins. Um, how do you think the end state might look like? Uh, will governments let these things uh, sort of exist uh, in any form or will they be extremely heavy handed given the secrecy aspect? If governments could not let these things exist, they would have already not let these things exist. But there are some cautionary tales, and we need to be clear on both what the risks are and the challenges we have ahead. We are poking a $150 trillion bear with a stick. At some point, it's going to turn around and take a swipe, and if you think it has, it hasn't yet. Not at all. Here's a little tidbit that will make you worry. E-gold has existed longer than Bitcoin. It lasted longer before they shut it down. Now, with decentralized systems that are based on a mathematical recipe, it's not that they can't necessarily disrupt and shut down one instance. They probably can, given enough investment, given enough terror tactics, given enough heavy-handed totalitarian drag you away in the middle of the night, beat you up with a rubber hose tactics, which a lot of governments are absolutely happy to apply in order to maintain power, and will apply, and do apply. The thing is, and I think a lot of the people who are beginning to understand this technology really understand is, if they do that, they encourage a game of whack-a-mole. They become the trigger that causes punctuated evolution, meaning that there is no reason to develop privacy technology strongly right now, because no one is trying to stomp on it. The moment someone tries to stomp on it, now there's all the incentives and money flows, in fact, to create a far more anonymous, far more stealthy, far more evasive system. One that responds exactly to the threats that just arose. It's an evolutionary system, because you have independent units that operate and can be modified, directed evolution, not random, but which is even more powerful, it will evolve to adjust to the environmental niche. Right now, the environmental niche is benign. If it starts turning malign, then the system evolves to respond to that threat. And because this is an idea based on mathematics, there will be hundreds, there will be thousands, they will evolve. You step on one, five more pop up, and they are designed to avoid you stepping on them, because now they need to. Totalitarian governments get this. If you step on Bitcoin, which is the teddy bear of cryptocurrencies, what you'll end up with is a highly localized, own language, super stealthy system written by the very dissidents within your country. Or as I like to say, right now, Bitcoin's a gecko. Every time you step on it, it evolves. One day it's a Komodo dragon. And when you try to step on that thing, it will bite your foot off. Won't Bitcoin's confidential transactions be censored? In light of the advent of new technologies such as Schnorr signatures, confidential transactions, etc., I would like to ask if this trend has the potential to make KYC, or Know Your Customer Compliant Companies, enforce a policy of not accepting a certain kind of Bitcoin transaction just as Japanese exchanges were recently pushed to drop privacy coins. Such companies may go as far as to not accept any transaction that has been tainted, uh, for example, obfuscated the amount or has a mixer transaction at any point in the past. Unlike current AML policies, such a rule won't require blockchain forensics in order to establish current transactions ancestry, merely require businesses to keep track of the UTXO set and tagging any output which has at least one tainted input. 
Yes, of course, the tainted base will theoretically keep growing, but at the same time, such a policy will introduce a strong incentive for customers to stay away from tainted coins. And of course, by extension, stay away from privacy technologies. How do you expect this all to play out? Aha! Hmm. Uh, this is a very, very good question, and it's also a very astute reading of kind of the incentives and challenges with implementing privacy technology. Um, there are some really spectacular developers, cryptographers, and individuals in this space whose driving principles of privacy, transaction privacy, specifically the cypherpunk ethos, and their attempt to preserve anonymity for purely political purposes, recognizing that this is a fundamental human right that must absolutely be defended. We are so lucky to have individuals like that. Um, and there, there are many across the entire cryptocurrency space. This is not just in Bitcoin, of course, it's across the entire cryptocurrency space, but um, specifically in the area of Schnorr signatures and confidential transactions and other technologies that are related from a privacy perspective. Um, one, of the, one of the key inventors in the space is Greg Maxwell, who has a lifelong dedication to privacy technologies. Um, and the cypherpunk ethos. And he's been working with a number of other very talented uh, mathematicians, cryptographers, and software engineers, uh, people like Andrew Polster, for example, and Peter Wool, um, to build some very interesting constructs. And I'm probably forgetting some names that deserve uh, kudos. And it's again, as, as I said, not just Bitcoin. There's um, some incredible implementations coming out of other privacy related coins. Uh, implementation of zk snarks, uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, the implementation of bulletproof technology, and the the idea which uh, came out of some of the Bitcoin developers, but then was implemented in Monero very recently um, to reduce uh, fees and increase security at the same time. So one of the inventions that isn't talked about so much, and I talked about it recently is Taproot and Graftroot. And this is a fantastic idea. And the primary idea came from Greg Maxwell. And the idea of Taproot and Graftroot is, what if we could create a transaction that on the surface looks like a pay to public key hash? So it looks like a payment to a public key, uh, just like every other Bitcoin transaction. However, what is not obvious from the transaction and is impossible to tell from the transaction is that that public key isn't actually a single uh, public key created from a private key. Instead, it's a composite key created either by a very complex multisig or even better, is the basis for a complex Merkleized script, uh, which has clauses underneath, such as a lightning payment channel, a complex multi-sig with time locks, a multi-party signature, um, a coin join um, transaction with multiple participants and multiple outputs. So, the fantastic thing about this is you can take all of these privacy-preserving, very complex scripts, uh, including confidential transactions, and then you can make them look like a public key payment. And Taproot and Graftroot, these two technologies together, um, do that. And what they do is they make the privacy-preserving transactions indistinguishable, even against a determined adversary that is trying to distinguish them from normal payments. They allow you to hide the little gems of privacy inside the the chaff of everyday transactions, so that it is impossible to single out the private transactions and censor them, uh, which of course is the big problem with privacy technologies. If the people doing them are a small subset, they only do them occasionally, and they can be distinguished, then that defeats the entire purpose. Taproot and Graftroot, in fact, are so important to this implementation that. Um, the developers who are working on confidential transactions and SNOR signatures have decided to delay implementation and have decided to sequence them such that 
Taproot and Graftroot are launched at the same time, so that people who decide to use the privacy-enhancing technologies are protected because they can use these technologies in a way that is indistinguishable to the network from regular transactions. And that decision is really critical. It was made just a few months ago. Um, it is why we are going to see a slight delay in the implementation of Schnorr signatures and confidential transactions, and why we will see um, the entire package of Schnorr signatures, confidential transactions, um, and Taproot and Graphroot launch simultaneously as a package of updates that happen at the same time, allowing people to both use their privacy and not be outed for using their privacy. A really, really good strategic choice, in my opinion. Um, I, I believe Peter Wool uh, was one of the uh, strong proponents of doing it in that particular order, together, of course, with Greg Maxwell. Thank you.